sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Let's stand together. Praise him. church. hope that y'all are having a wonderful morning so far. And uh, we have already had the opportunity in our first service to baptize uh, one, and we're, uh, we've got another one that's going to be coming this morning to follow through with Believer's Baptism. And they come knowing that there is nothing special about this water, um, but it is the first step inside of a new personal relationship with Jesus. And this is Miss Avery, and uh, Miss Avery is a third grader here. She has been uh, coming to our church now uh, for a while. She was at our vacation Bible school, and through our vacation Bible school, we, uh, she was able to uh, have some really good conversations that has led to um, her deciding that she wants to start a personal relationship with Jesus. And so, Avery, it is my honor, but also my responsibility to ask you 
who is the Lord and Savior of your life. It's upon that profession that I get the opportunity to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Man, we are so blessed that God allows us to be a part of a church that uh, almost every time we come into this place, we get to see someone through the baptismal waters professing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And uh, the prayer is that we would never take that for granted. If anything, it would motivate us to be uh, more witnessing and more powerful in our testimony when it comes to sharing of the change that Jesus has done in our own lives. Uh, I can promise you, uh, you know, there, there are folks that want to debate theology. There are folks that want to talk about questions and, you know, just folks love to get their own little uh, soapbox and stand on it and I'm right in this and you're wrong in this and all that kind of stuff. Instead, how about we decide to be united about sharing the greatest thing this world needs to hear and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Hey, if you're visiting with us today, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I, I was walking in and somebody said, what are, you, what are you doing wearing that vest? Well, at 7 o'clock this morning when it was 49 degrees, it was a great idea. Um, rethinking that right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, what do they say about Florida? If you don't like the weather, wait about an hour and it'll change on you. Usually it doesn't even have to take that long. But uh, beautiful day it is, beautiful day outside, beautiful day that we can gather together in here as a body of believers. And so I would encourage you today, be in prayer for all the things that are happening, not only on this campus, but the other churches and campuses that we planted, and not just what's happening in this room. There's a lot of other things that are taking place today that are good and are edifying to the body. Body of Christ, and so we're thankful for that. If you came in the main entrance, now it's called the main entrance uh, because it's right there off of 231, the portico's there, and the big steeple, and all that. But the reality is, very few folks come through the main entrance. Uh, our campus is set up in such a way that everybody comes in other doors. But if you came in the main entrance today and you made your way down that hallway, uh, you saw right outside of the uh, office complex door a, uh, a special Christmas tree out there. Um, bright orange from the top to the bottom. And uh, I've been told that it is a tender Tennessee Christmas tree. Is what that is. It is a gift for me. It's not a tree that I set up or anything. I'm not that narcissistic that I would put up a tree right there for my team. And I'm not foolish enough to do it after we've lost two weeks in a row by 20 points each time. <laughs> but uh, I will say this, it was a gift to the pastor. So if you have any idea of stealing any of those Tennessee Christmas ornaments, you keep your hands off of them, they're mine. Um, and we'll get that out of the hallway, the mall way, just as, just as quick as we can and put it in a more prominent location. Um, we're thinking about putting it up there in the top of that area where the windows are, right below the steeple, um, so folks can see that as they drive by. Uh, but anyway, I'm just being foolish now. But uh, if you did see that, that was a gift for me. And, uh, you know, thank God for basketball seasons, all I can say. If you're visiting with us, we'd love to tell you about our church, ways that you can get plugged in and get involved. You heard me say that it's so important to get involved in things outside of just what happens in this room. We have life group, Bible study groups. We have mission organizations. We have ministry opportunities. Just a little smaller type group that you can be a part of, that you can get to know somebody. They can get to know you. They know how to pray for you. You know how to pray for them. That's key. That's very important uh, in a church our size. So let us encourage you to do that. But but one of the best things that you can do to help us with that is fill out one of our guest registration cards if you've never done that. We have physical cards that are in the chair back pockets all around this room, or you can fill out an electrical guest card. Uh, there'll be a number that comes up on the screen right at the end of the service, and all you have to do is text the word guest to that phone number that's on the screen that goes to our staff, and they'll start the process to be able to get you registered as a guest with us. Let us encourage you this as well. Whether you fill it out uh, physically or electronically or you're just like, I'm not feeling anything out. Whatever it is, 
Would you at least stop by the Welcome Center before you leave today? Let us get a chance to meet you face to face. Let us give you some information, answer those questions, pray with you. Um, there'll be folks out there after the service, and we also have a little sweet, it's not much, but it's a little sweet treat that we like to give our guests as well. But do that before you leave today. I want to go ahead and ask our ushers to come forward this morning. One of the things that we do when we gather together as a corporate body is we worship him through our song, and we worship him through our giving. Uh, that this is an act of worship, it is an act of faith, and because of your faithful giving as a church, we are able to do incredible things uh, as we carry the gospel of Jesus Christ all the way across the world, and we also carry him across our community here in Bay County. So um, let us encourage you to give today. You can give by putting something physical in the bucket as it comes by, or you can give electronically. You'll see a number on the screen. I did that in my office before I came out this morning. Did the text to give. doesn't matter the way that you give. Let us just be faithful to give. And I stand up here week after week and tell you different ways that your giving is used. And um, all you have to do is look around and see how God uses our obedience and our faithfulness in this matter. But the reality is this. If I never stood up here and told you a story of tangibly how your giving is used as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should give because it is an act of faith where you say, Lord, I'm not putting my faith in my resources to meet my needs. I'm putting my faith in my God to meet my needs. And I'm going to give back to you a portion of that which you've so richly blessed me with. So let us be faithful to give today. Let me lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can gather together in this place. Thank you for the testimony publicly of this one in the baptismal waters, professing you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. And Father, our prayer is that we as followers of Christ, that that would be every day of our life, unashamedly professing you, unashamedly being obedient and following you. Lord, even as we take this offering today, our prayer is that you would take it and you would use it in ways that are beyond anything that we could ever imagine. That, Father, that you would multiply this gift and it would be used for greater purposes than if it stayed in our own pockets. I think every one of us, Father, in this room would admit that we have been blessed beyond anything that we deserve. No matter where we are in the socioeconomic ladder, we have been blessed. And those blessings have come from your hands. So we return this portion to you today, asking you to use it in such a way as you provide through your local church here at Highland Park, as we share the gospel far and wide and near and dear. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Jesus, that the only reason today that we can even sing songs of praise in your name, the only way that we can even call out to the Father is because of you and the, the opportunity that you've given us as your followers. So today we thank you for that relationship. We thank you for our, being our high priest and our mediator. Today, Lord Jesus, we exalt your name for you're the one who is worthy to be praised. We pray this prayer in your name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.
Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, this morning, Lord, we praise you. Thank you for your wonderful work on the cross, Lord. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for this moment that we have, Lord, just to open your word, Lord, to hear straight from you, Lord. And Lord, as we do, Lord, we just pray you'd open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. In the precious, powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I love that song. It is known as a modern day hymn. You're like, oh, I thought hymns were supposed to be old. Well, no, not if they're modern. If you have your Bibles this morning, open them up to John chapter 8. We're continuing in our verse by verse study through the book of John, a series entitled Life in His Name. And today we find ourselves talking about something that we've talked about quite a few times already in the book of John, light and life, light and life. I love the story of the dad who was passing by his young son's room one night. He looked in and he saw his young son on his knees next to his bed. And so he walked in, he said, son, what are you doing? He said, well, dad, I'm talking to Howard. Well, his dad said, who's Howard? And his son gazed at him with this, and you parents will understand this, kind of that look of all adults are dumb. And he said, who's Howard? You know who Howard is. Don't you ever listen in church? He said, every single Sunday we pray, our Father who art in heaven, Howard be your name. And so he said, I'm talking to Howard, I'm talking to God. Um, well, God, God does have a name, but it's not Howard. And in the Bible, we see all different kinds of names that help us understand the character and the nature of God. We're going to see this morning the, the name I Am. It's one of the most powerful names of God. Over in Genesis chapter 3, if you remember, God told Moses, I Am. When Moses said, well, who am I supposed to say sent me? Tell him I am has sent you. I am means this. I have always existed and I will always exist. So that means that before time ever even began, God was. And there will never be a time where God will never be, nor has there ever been a time where he has not existed. You're like, I just can't understand that. Help me understand that. Well, I don't understand it either. Makes no sense to me, but just because I don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not true. God has always been. 45 times in the book of John, Jesus uses that phrase, I am. Seven of those times, he says, I am, and he says, something or someone. Back in John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. That was his first I am statement. And this morning, we're going to see that he makes another I am statement. I am the light of the world. Look there with me, John chapter 8, verse 20. Or excuse me, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, then Jesus spoke to them again. That's the religious leaders, okay? He spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, but I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And then they said to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet Come. Now, have you noticed that we've read that phrase many times? His hour had not yet come. 
it meant they weren't going to lay a hand on him until the Lord was good and ready for that to happen. Now, this passage talks about light and life. And as we've already mentioned several times in our study in the book of John, that where there is light, there is life. We see that in all of creation. That that's the way that God has chosen to do it. See, God arranged our days in a way that there are hours of sunlight to walk and live. That means that when the sun's out, you're supposed to be alive. Some of you have it backwards. I get that. He turns off the lights by doing what? By rotating the earth. So now that we are in the shadow of the sun. So he has given us the night as a gift so that we can sleep and we can recharge our batteries. I just say that to say that all throughout creation, we see that there is a direct connection between light and life. And that's what I want us to look at today. In this message, we're going to talk about the light of Jesus, and we're going to talk about the life of Jesus and how he offers each to you and I. First of all, let's talk about his light. And his light, it overcomes darkness. You see, in the beginning of the world, in the beginning of creation, there was no light. The Bible says this, there was only darkness and there was only chaos. That the very first recorded words of God in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, are, let there be light. Oh, and by the way, when God said it, it happened, and it still happens that way. And on the fourth day, God said this, or God did this. God put the sun and the moon in the sky. And I can just imagine, I don't know when God was finished, I don't know, I, I just imagine one of the angels saying, hey, are we, are we finished for now? And God just said, yeah, how about we just call it a day, right? We'll call it a day, and that's what it'll be. And so we see this happening all throughout creation. Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1, it's almost like you're reading the exact same thing. Genesis 1 begins with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 is this way. In the beginning was the Word. You see, both of them are saying this, that Jesus is both the source of light and the source of life. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, I want you to hear what it says. Look at the screens. It says, in him, him being Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We've just seen that in this passage of Scripture, haven't we? Now, there are many different ways that Jesus is a light for us. I'll talk about three of them this morning. First of all, just like a light, Jesus' light, it illuminates the mind. Now, let's put this in context. Jesus is still in Jerusalem. It's after the Feast of Tabernacles. And so during the Feast of Tabernacles, we know that was a time of great celebration. He's standing here in the temple courts, the Bible says, near the treasury. One of the things that would happen every evening during the Feast of Tabernacles there in Jerusalem is there was a ritual called the Temple Illumination. They had four very tall poles, each 70 feet tall, and in each pole there were four huge oil lamps, and in those lamps were five gallons of olive oil. And what they would do is they would use the priest's old worn garments as a wick, and they would light those four tall lamps. Each night the young priest would come and they would have to climb up that 70-foot ladder. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't even OSHA safe. And they would climb up that 70-foot ladder, and they would light that wick, and those four huge lamps, bystanders said, said that it would illuminate the entire city of Jerusalem. If you've been there, think about that. Jesus is standing there at the temple treasury, He's standing there, what would have been below one of these huge lamps, when he said this, you think these lamps light up something? You think they're great and powerful with their light? I'm telling you, I am the light of the world. And anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness. See, friends, I want you to hear this. 
Just like those four huge lamps lit up that city, Jesus Christ wants to light up more than just your city. He wants to light up more than just the treasury, right? He wants to light up your world. Jesus said, I'm telling you, I am offering light that is greater than anything that you have ever seen. There is nothing that can even compare to what Christ is offering here. I think we would agree that light's important. Why? It's important to see. Jennifer and I, every now and then, we'll find ourselves in a restaurant that has the lights that are really low. You're looking at the menu. You can't see what it says. I'm looking for the price. (laughs) Can't see that. I, I, I have this I have this philosophy or this idea that the darker the restaurant, the higher the cost of food. (laughs) But over the last several years, there is a great, great device that I've had. It's called a smart device. I find myself using it quite a bit now. I've even brought it up here. Nobody texts me, okay? I've got it turned off. Well, almost turned off. I'll find myself in those restaurants, and here's what I'll do. You're like, that's embarrassing. Not to me. (laughs) And I'll take that, and I'll put it right next down to that menu. And I'll look over, and I'm like, a six-ounce sirloin cost what? This is crazy. You know, I'm looking at the prices, but after I finish, and I'll order, and I'll take that thing, and... I'll, I'll, I'll just slide it right down in my pocket. I never even turn it off. <laughs> just leave the light on. Pull it out again because I know I'm going to need it pretty soon. Find myself in a grocery store. You've, am I the only one? You're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Find myself in a grocery store and, and there's a particular kind of yogurt that my wife likes. It's a Greek yogurt. And, and so I've been known to buy some that have been out of date. And so I'll reach and I'll grab that thing. And have you noticed how small they print the expiration date on the yogurt? I'll sit there in a fully lit grocery store. I'll pull out my smart device. And I look there. There's a particular bread that our family likes. And they used to have these little clips that they would put on the bread. The clips are still there, but they would put the expiration date on the clips. Well, over the last several months, somebody thought it'd be a good idea that instead of putting the expiration date on those little white clips that people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s can read, they decided they would start stamping it on an off-brown color package. I can't read it. I'll hold my light up to it. And I'm like, I don't know what that says. Is that November? Is that 22? What is that? And I don't even find shame in this. I will turn and I will find someone younger than me. And I'll say, can you tell me what that says? I'm not, I'm not paying $13 for a pack of bread to take it home. And it's going to be out of date. This is a great thing. I love this. Not only does it have a flashlight on it, but it has navigation on it. I use it all the time. It tells me how to get where I'm going. Thank God. You remember those old days with the old maps and you have to unfold it and unfold it and unfold it? We got lost one time about 25 years ago in Chicago and we had every stinking flap on that map open. We almost got killed. <laughs> you can play games on it. Isn't that neat? You can check the weather. Should have done that this morning. It said 49 when I left the house. What does it say? Let me look. 70 degrees right now. <laughs> My goodness. You can even read your Bible on it. That's what some of you are doing right now, isn't it? Sure you are. <laughs> but by far the best thing is the flashlight. Do you know what I've been told? This is interesting. I found this out the other day. You can even call people on this thing. Dial their number, you talk to them, they talk to you. I mean, it's just a smart device. But by far, to me, again, the greatest part of it is I can turn this flashlight on, I can light it up, and I can read, and it helps me to be able to see. We need a good light that helps us be able... Let me turn this off. Let me 
Do we have anybody under the age of 10 that can turn this off from? <laughs> there, turned it off. All right, good deal. We, we need, right, a good light to be able to read, and we need the brightness of Jesus, guys, in order to help us, what, understand the very word of God. And what happens is before a person comes to Christ, their understanding is darkened. Before they come to Christ, there is no light that is illuminating their mind. I've had folks that have come to me and here's what they said. You know what, Pastor? I, I read the Bible before. It just doesn't make much sense to me. But you know what I have found? I have found that once I gave my life to Jesus, it's like somebody turned the light on. That once I got saved, it's like, it's like I was reading in a foreign language. And now it's, it's written in my language. And I can understand. And it's illuminating, right? He begins to illuminate the mind. The light comes on. That is the illuminating power of Jesus Christ. So I would just say this, that when you're reading the Bible, be sure that you ask God to give you that light of understanding, that light of illumination. So what does he do? He illuminates the mind. That's how his light works. But then secondly, his light imparts the problem. Do you know what the greatest problem that mankind faces today? The greatest problem of mankind is the problem of sin. Why? Because sin separates us from God. Why? Because sin brings eternal death. And so the light of Jesus imparts or it reveals or it exposes the sin in our lives. What happens is we tend to think that our deeds are, are hidden in darkness, that no one knows about our deeds except ourselves. We even say that we can, we can hide our deeds of darkness to everyone else, but not God. God sees and God knows. And so as his light shines, right, it exposes our sin. It imparts and reveals our sin. I want you to listen to what Jesus said about this. Don't take my words for it. This is found in Mark chapter 4, verse 22. He said, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and nothing hidden that will not be brought to light. The problem, right? The greatest problem of mankind, the problem of our sin that separates us from God, right? The only way that that can be fixed is by the light of Jesus shining into it. Most dentists, they use these uh, like, like super strong binocular loops to be able to, to look in your mouth when they are working on your mouth. And it, it kind of, it, it's a very strong, powerful light that is in there. And it's a very direct light that just shines exactly where they need it to shine. And it magnifies everything. And that is so important for them to use such a high, powerful, magnifying light. Why? Because they're e you know, that way it's easier for them to identify the problem within your teeth. You say, why is that important? You ever had a dentist feel the wrong tooth? How horrible would that be? No, you want him to understand where the problem is so that he might be able to identify how to solve that problem, how to fix that problem, how to, how to do his job. And so that's the way God is using this convicting light of the Holy Spirit in your life. I've heard folks say this, well, you know what? You can fool others, but you can't fool yourself. Can I just say that's not true? You can fool yourself. The Bible talks about self-deception. Listen to what it says in James 1.22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, what? Deceiving yourselves. Self-deception happens when you think that no one else knows about your secret sin. Self-deception happens when you think that you've gotten away with it. And the truth is that you can fool others. You can even fool yourself, but you cannot fool God. And what happens is, that is as individuals, folks will start getting arrogant and think that they're pretty good people, or at least we think that everybody else thinks that we're pretty good people, but we're, 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 we're really good at one thing, and that is hiding our faults. Let me ask you this morning. How would you react if today, at this point in the service, I'm like, you know what? We've already sang the songs. I've already given you a little bit. I'll pick up where we left off last week. But for the remaining part of the service, before we come to that invitation song, that song of praise, what you don't know is we've been following you around for a week. And we've been videoing everything. We've been recording every word that has been said. Matter of fact, we have 
a powerful apparatus, a mechanism that can even read your mind. So everything you've thought, we've got it. And we're now going to play it on the big screens. And everybody's going to get to see and everybody's going to get to hear not only what you said and done, but also they're going to read the intent or the thoughts of your mind. Now the good news is there is no mechanism that I'm aware of that will do that. And if we did have it, I can promise you we would throw it away as quickly as we could because somebody might use it on me. How would you react? If you're here today and you know Jesus, here's what you would say. You would say, that's the reason why I'm not depending upon my good works to get me to heaven because all my good works are nothing like nothing but a bunch of dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking rags when it comes to God. No, no, no. I'm not depending upon my works for heaven. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. That's my hope. That's my trust. But if you're here today... If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you'd be confronted again with the truth that you can't live a perfect life. You would be confronted again with the truth that you have been separated from God because of your sin. You will be confronted with the truth that you have fallen short of God's glory. Now, again, we're not going to show a movie, but remember, there is nothing hidden from God. I, I, I just want you to understand that you're not getting away with anything and there's no deception when it comes to God. So the light of Jesus, it illuminates the mind. It imparts the problem of sin. It exposes the problem of sin. But then third, it instructs the path. You want to know one of the reasons the Jews would light those big lamps during the Feast of Passover or during the Feast of Tabernacles when they were celebrating how God had led them and guided them during this time of wilderness? It's commemorating the time that God used that fiery pillar, right, to instruct them which way to go. Listen to what the Bible says, church. This is in Exodus chapter 13, verse 12. Look at the screens. It says, he guided them by day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. So they would sit there and they would say, hey, God, which way do you want us to go? And oh, there's the, there's the cloud, there's the, there's the pillar of the cloud, and we're going to follow that, and we'll, we'll stop when that stops. And you know what, when that thing starts moving again, then we're going to pack everything up, and we're going to go, we're going to follow that. And we're, that's the direction, the pillar of the cloud and the pillar of fire at night. That'll lead us in the way that we're supposed to go. And how many of us read that, and we're like, you know what? It'd be a lot easier if God still worked that way. Wouldn't it be a lot easier today if you're sitting there and you're like, you know what, I really know, I really need to know how God wants me to go, what direction, what his will is for my life when it comes to this. And you just look up and you're like, oh, well, there's the cloud. I'll just follow the cloud. Or there's God's pillar of fire. <laughs> I'll just follow that. I'll go until that stops. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if God worked that way? Well, friend, I want you to hear me. God's given us something that is much greater and much more reliable than a cloud or a fire. It's his word. That's how he leads. That's how he guides. That's how he directs. It is his word. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, 105. In Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Hear me, guys. The Bible is not some magical book of incantations that you can just open and point your finger at a verse and get directions. Some people treat it that way, and they point to a verse that is totally unrelated to what they need, and they give up, and they think the Bible is unreliable. Or here's the way they treat his guidance. You know what, Lord? I'm facing a decision when it comes to my kids. Oh, let me go back over here, and let me find a verse that has to deal with kids and parenting. Or there's a marriage. Let me find a verse 
that has to deal with something I'm dealing with in my marriage. And the only time we ever open the book is we're trying to find something and we're looking for a verse or something along those lines. And we say, it just makes no sense. It's unreliable. Well, understand, and you get into God's word every day and you ask his spirit, would you please illuminate my mind? You'll discover that God will give you all the guidance that you ever need day by day by day. Don't look for the clouds. I'm amazed by folks that sit there and say, well, you know what? I was driving down the road and I looked over the billboard and on that billboard it said something and it was cryptic. I mean, it was, supposedly it was talking about milk, but no, it wasn't milk. It was God talking to me. And through that billboard, I read something cryptic and I know that that tells me what I'm supposed to do. Or I was sitting on my back porch. You know what? I was looking up in the sky and I'm sitting there and I'm like, Lord, do you want our family to get a dog? And all of a sudden I looked and I'm like, well, look at there. There's a dog right there in the those clouds. Do you see it? I mean, it's a, it's a three-legged dog, but look at it. Look at it. It's a dog. I'm amazed at the people that profess to be followers of Christ that look in every other arena and area, area except the Word of God to determine His plan and His guidance and His will. Well, I was, I was watching this TV show the other day <laughs> I was talking to this person at work. Now, they're not a Christ follower. But, you know, they all know something about marriage because they're on number five. <laughs> mm. Get into God's word. He'll give you the guidance. All that you'll ever need. So his light overcomes darkness. But let's talk about his life. Because not only does his light overcome darkness, secondly, his life crushes death. Oh, this is my favorite part. Pick up where we left off there in John chapter 8. Pick up in verse 21. He says in 21, Then Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, You are from beneath. I am from above. Now, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what that means. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you'll die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They didn't understand that what he spoke to them was of the Father. And then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. So here's this ongoing conversation that is taking place between he and these Jewish leaders. And every time Jesus said something, it just made him, it made him angrier and angrier. And he made a claim here that it was his father from heaven who sent him. His father from heaven who told him what to say. His father from heaven who told him what to do. But these scribes and these Pharisees they couldn't understand what he was saying. Why? Because they had already made up their mind that he was simply a religious imposter. But he shared great truths. Oh, what great truths we just read. Many that are found here. I'll just share two with you this morning. The first truth revolving around the fact that his life crushes death is this. The cross draws people to Jesus. Jesus knew that he was going to go to the cross. Jesus knew that he then would go to a grave. He knew then that he would rise from the dead. He knew that he would eventually return to heaven. That's the reason why he told these religious leaders, where I'm going, you can't go. In John, there are three occasions where Jesus predicted that he would be lifted up. You can go back to John chapter 3, and in John chapter 3, Jesus said this, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man, that was the title that belonged to him, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. 
Right here, we just read it, John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus said that when he was lifted up, they then would know who he was. You're like, what do you mean by that? We don't have to wonder. We'll get to John chapter 12, and in John chapter 12, he's going to tell us exactly what he meant by that. Matter of fact, let's look at it. John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. Now, in a few months, we will get there, and when we do, act like we've not read this. Look at what it says. Jesus said, as for me, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Think about this. In hindsight, it seems crazy. So this Jewish rabbi, right? This, this, this religious teacher has just said, do you know what? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'll be crucified and I will be executed. And do you know what's going to draw people to me? My execution. You know what's going to draw people to me? My death. My crucifixion on a cross. Makes no sense. That's what he's going to use to draw people to himself? Now, we talk about him being lifted up. Scripture also tells us in other places that when he is lifted up, all men will be drawn into him. It's kind of something that's very important to us as a church. Everything that we do, we want to lift Jesus up. Everything that we uh, say, everything that we believe, Jesus is going to be at the forefront of all of it. He permeates everything. When we sit there and we are in a room and we are saying, you know what, how is our strategy when it comes to this? How do we want to approach this? How do we want to fulfill this? We have those conversations as you're staff and as your leaders and even as your laity, as your volunteers. But I can promise you, we never ever have the conversation, what are we going to say to them? You say, why do you not say that? Because we know what we're going to say to them. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ will forgive your sin. If you'll just trust him, if you'll put your faith in him, not only will he light up your world, he'll give you life. Now it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Are you telling me he's going to give life through death? It's confounding, isn't it? God says, I will use, I will use things that will confound the wise. You're like, why would he choose to give life out of death? What was the greatest problem? Sin. What was the cure? The perfect lamb. So we sit there and we say, we want to lift Jesus up, right? We want to lift Jesus up because we want all men to be drawn to him. We want everyone that we come into contact with to be drawn to Jesus. That's the reason why the songs that we sing here, they're going to be songs about Jesus. That's the reason why every time we gather in this place, I can promise you, you will hear this pastor preach about Jesus Christ. I've even had some folks say, all you ever want to do is talk about Jesus. I consider that a compliment. I know you didn't intend it that way, but I consider it a compliment. I'm on task because it's all about Jesus. I was taught this by an old backwoods rural pastor who had never been to seminary, right? He had never gotten a college education. I sat down with him and I said, I believe God's calling me to ministry. Had no idea what that meant. I said, can you give me some words of advice? He said a couple of things and two things that I've really held dear to. One of the things he said is, listen, after Sunday services, always wash your hands twice. And I do that. There's some wisdom in that. And here's what he said. He said, I don't care where you're preaching from. You make a beeline to the cross as quick as you can. Because the cross changes everything. That's what Christ is saying right here. Christ is saying right here, they're going to lift me up on a cross, right? They're going to lift me up so the price can be paid. And right now, you don't know who I am. Right now, you're so blinded. But I'm telling you, the world will finally understand who I am once I'm lifted up on the cross. Because the cross changes everything everything 
when we built this building the first time before the hurricane, you know, and they, they, put, they, have a, they had a rugged cross that was up there in the baptistry. And so we replaced that cross with, a, with another cross. And um, you can't see it because the, the screen's down. And that perfect, that's perfect. See, there are times that I, that I come in here I, I'm probably the only one. We, we, know that, we know that praise is not just limited to Sunday morning. Praise is not just limited to, to the corporate body of believers. That if you come in here today and you're like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know about the praise today. It really wasn't that good. Music wasn't that good. Sermon wasn't that good. I didn't get anything out of the service. just wasn't really good. Well, that could be an indication that there's no praise happening Monday through Saturday because your Sunday praise is going to be a reflection of your Monday through Saturday praise. So I get what I'm saying, that, that, that praise is not something that is, just, that is just involved or just happens when we gather together in this room. But I'm telling you that there are times I will walk into this room. It has nothing to do with you, right? There are times that I'll walk into this room, and here's what I'll think. Man, whew, I'm struggling today. There are times that I'll come into this room and, man, they'll be up here and they'll be singing and naturally they're going to be singing about Jesus and they're going to be smiling and they're really going to be into it. And, you know, they, it's crazy. It's like sometimes you think, they believe what they're singing. It's an amazing thing. And, 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 and I'll come into this and I'll see that and I'll sit there and I'm like, you know what, but I'm so discouraged. And there are times that I'll come in and I'll be like, you know what, I'm, I'm, man, I'm disappointed. I mean, I mean, I'm disappointed in somebody else or maybe I'm disappointed in myself, but, but I'm just disappointed. And I'll come in and I'm like, you know what, I, 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 need to, I need to focus, man. Why am I here? Why am I here? And, and what happened is when, when we replaced that cross up there and we put that center screen up there and all of a sudden that center screen would come down and, and my focus was always on the cross. But now we got a screen up there. And so I went to one of our deacons and I said, Deacon Denny, I don't call him that. I just found it humorous to say that. <laughs> Denny, man, I know you're good at woodworking. You think you could build us two big crosses and put on either side of the screen? He said, well, yeah, you just tell me what you want. And I said, and by the way, my eyes are getting old. I, I, I don't want to have my flashlight up. You think you could backlight those crosses? So when they turn the lights down real low, even with feeble eyes, I, I, I could still stay focused on the cross. He said, man, yeah, we can do anything. I'm just saying, guys, there are times I walk in the room and I'm discouraged. There are times I walk in the room, I'm disappointed. Can I be honest? There are times I walk into this room and I'm thinking, who am I to walk into this place? Who am I to be singing about the name of Jesus? Who am I? I'm just a dirty, rotten person. Who am I? And then all of a sudden, I say, oh, that's who I am. It was because of the cross. It was because of what Jesus Christ did. It's what happened when he lifted me up. I don't walk into this place today because... Because I'm walking in my own righteous deeds. I walk into this place today because I've now been declared righteous because he was lifted up. My faith is in him. He's the one who says I am worthy. Not based on my deeds. Based upon his accomplished work on the cross. I'm just saying, he says, when you lift me up, when you exalt who I am, when you finally understand I am accomplishing and remedying and fixing seen the greatest problem mankind has ever known, the problem of sin, and you've lifted me up, all of a sudden, I'll flat light up your world. I'm telling you, I will give you life. Oh my goodness, I couldn't get that out quick enough. The cross draws people to Jesus. The cross draws people to Jesus. If we're going to be known about anything, church, let's be known about the cross. It draws people to Jesus. Mm. Let's move on. Mm. Now 
Number two. Or B. There are two ways to die. <laughs> Some of you think, I was with you on most of that, but I, I'm not with you on this. There are not two ways to die. Here's what we realize. If the Lord tarries, that means if he waits to come back much longer, we're all going to die. And there are many different ways to physically die. No one knows physically how they're going to die. I googled this week, um, you know, what are the ways that most people want to die? I would not encourage that. <laughs> but I read some, some of you are doing it right now. <laughs> and I was reading some things and, you know, and like 60% or most of the people said, I would like to die in my bed at home. Well, that makes sense. I mean, as long as it was a situation where, like, I went to sleep and I just didn't wake up. I don't want to lay there and linger in my bed at home. How do you want to die? One guy said this. Um, he said that he would like to die by, um, by jumping out of an airplane, thinking that his chute was going to work, and when he pulled it, all of a sudden he realized that it didn't work, and that's how he would die. I'm like, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Who would want to die that way? My goodness. One woman said this, and I don't even understand this, but here's what she said. I want to be tickled to death. <laughs> Is that possible? Can that happen? And if it can, that, that sounds terrible to me. One guy, one guy that was surveyed, one of the questions they asked was, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Here was his response. I want them to say about me at my funeral, look, he's moving. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty, pretty good thing to say, right? We're not talking about physical death here. We're not physical. We're talking about, we're, we're talking about spiritual, a spiritual perspective, that there are two ways to die. Only two ways that a person can die spiritually. They'll either die in their sin or they'll die in the Lord. Jesus talks about this three times, guys. He says this to these religious leaders. You can look back in verse 21. He says this, and you will die in your sin. Verse 24, he says, you will die in your sins. Again, in verse 24, he says, if you do not believe in me, you will die in your sins. Now, I don't know about you, but when Jesus repeats something three times in a row, I think it's very important for us to understand what he is talking about. See, a person dies in their sin if they do not believe that Jesus came from heaven, that he is the Son of God, and they surrender their life to him. Actually, can I tell you, that's everyone's default condition. You don't have to do anything to die in your sin. Well, except sin. And we're not giving courses on that. You've got that down pretty good. Years ago, somebody handed me a gospel track. You remember those old gospel tracks? On the outside of the gospel track, here's what it said. What to do to go to hell. You opened it up and it was blank. No words at all. It was basically conveying the idea, what do you have to do to go to hell? You don't have to do anything to go to hell. But then there's another way to die. You can die in the Lord. And, and let me say, there's really nothing that you can die, do either to die in the Lord. Why? We mentioned it. It's already been done on the cross. That all you have to do is believe and receive the free gift of eternal life in Jesus and you will be saved. And then it even says this, that there is a tremendous blessing awaiting those who die in the Lord. We read about it in the very last book of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 13, look at the screen, look at what it says here. It says, then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labors since their works follow them. 
Your good works won't send you to heaven, but they will follow you there. So I can't predict this morning how you're going to die in terms of where you'll be and how it'll happen physically, but I can predict today that you will die spiritually in one of two ways. You will either die in your sin or you will die in the Lord. And so can I just say, if you have not yet, would you place your faith and trust in Jesus today so that one day you'll die in the Lord? One last thing and we'll be done. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then you read elsewhere that Jesus said about his followers, you are the light of the world. When I was a young, immature Christian, I remember thinking, you know what? I understand that Jesus is the light of the world, but how in the world am I supposed to be the light of the world? Well, I came to understand it in a way that helped me out. Maybe it'll help you as well. I want you to think of Jesus in terms of the sun, S-U-N, in the sky. The sun is the source of life, and it generates light. So, if Jesus is the sun, then his followers are the moon. I think you would agree that the moon shines brightly at times, which is interesting because The moon generates no light. Do you know the moon is a dead rock? You say, how does it shine brightly if it generates no light? It simply reflects the light of the sun. And if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you and I must reflect the light and the life of Jesus to those folks that are around us. You say, well, I would if I knew how. We don't have to worry about it. Jesus tells us exactly how we are to be light reflectors. It's found in Matthew 5, verse 16. Look at what it says. Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we reflect the light of Jesus Christ when you and I perform good deeds that point people to Jesus. You're like, oh, pastor, you're talking about random acts of kindness. No, I'm not. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I would submit to you there's no such thing as a random act of kindness. It is an intentional act of kindness. That intentionally, you sit there and say, you know what? I'm going to be the light of Jesus again. Why? Because the world that I'm in, would you agree with this statement that the very world that you are in is a follower of Jesus Christ, that God has placed you there so that you might shine brightly for him? I said, would you agree with that statement? Okay, all right, just want to make sure. Because if you don't, I might as well stop and we'll just go home. You and I reflect his light. We reflect his love. So what? So that they might have life. I choose to do this. This is intentional. So I look around. How can I earn the right to be heard? How can I meet their needs? How can I show them the love of Jesus Christ? You're like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to knock on their front door and I'm going to tell them, you know, get turned or get burned. Get right or get left behind. You know, I mean, be sanctified or be French fried. I don't know. I mean... Can I just say, that's not a very good evangelistic strategy. There's nothing wrong with going door-to-door witnessing. I'm I'm afraid we miss a lot because we want to set... mm, Anyway, that's another sermon another time. What it is, is this. I want them to know of the light that I've experienced. And I'm going to love them. So that they might have... Life. Life. That's what it means when it says that you and I as followers of Christ will be reflectors of his light and reflectors of his glory. True story that happened back in World War II. In the northern Atlantic Ocean, there was an aircraft carrier. And it was in danger from enemy submarines. And so what they did is, They launched out five of their best pilots, five of America's best, and their five best planes to go out and scout 
for these enemy submarines. Well, after they took off and got out there, all of a sudden the captain of the ship thought, oh, we're in a dangerous place. There's enemy subs all around and we're all lit up. And so he issued a command, I want you to turn off every single light. There will be a full blackout, every light off. And so they did what they were told. And then all of a sudden, these pilots in these planes started making their way back to the carrier, to the ship. One pilot radioed the aircraft carrier and he said, we're, we're coming home, give us some light to land by. And the radio operator of the ship said this, I'm sorry, but there's a total blackout. We cannot give you light. Another one of those pilots radioed in and he said this. He said, just give us some light. You don't have to give it all to us. Just give us some light and we'll land. And again, the order came back. It's a total blackout. We, we cannot give you some light. And in desperation, one of the pilots radioed in and he said, would you just give us one light? Give us one light so we can come back and find our way home. And the radio dispatcher on that aircraft carrier with a broken heart said, I can give you no light. And he shut off the switch. And five brave American pilots, five of America's best, went down in the darkness of the chilly waters of the northern Atlantic and out into eternity. What about it, fellow Christian? Will you give them some light so they can find their way home? Will you be the light to this broken world, reflecting the kindness of Jesus Christ to other people? Students, you may be the only one in your math class that dares to call on the name of Jesus. You may feel like an outcast. You may feel like that you're all alone. Oh no, friend. The Spirit of God is there with you. Show them the light. Show them the love of Jesus. At your workplace, it may be the same way. You're like, Pastor, everyone I work with uses foul language. They tell dirty jokes. All they live for is the weekend so they can get debaucherized. But you be the light of Jesus. Share the love of Jesus so that they might give you the opportunity to tell of life found in Christ. And friend, I close it this way today. That if you don't know Jesus today, would you come to the light of the world? Jesus overcome darkness. He crushed death. And when you place your faith and your trust in him, he'll give you light. More importantly, he'll give you life. And he's already done all that needs to be done right up there on that cross. Would you come to him today? Would you bow your heads with me? With your eyes bowed, your, excuse me, with your eyes closed, your head bowed. Let me first of all say this. Thank you for listening to me. I would ask you if you could hang on for just a little bit longer. Jesus invites you today, if you don't know him, to come to him. To put your faith and trust in him. To move from dying in your sin to dying in the Lord. Would you come to him today? To my brothers and sisters in Christ that already know where your eternal destination will be. Would you be the light in your family? Would you be the light in your world? Friend, listen to me. You don't have to cross the sea to make a difference for Christ. All you have to do is see the cross. Would you do that today? Oh God, may you speak. And may we be people who not just merely hear your word. May we be people who do it and are changed. And Lord, 
May our hearts today be hearts that are bent on being used by you to reflect the light that is never extinguished, to reflect the light that is eternal. In just a moment, we're going to stand. And there are going to be pastors down front if you're here today and you say, you know what, today I'm ready to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm surrendering to him. I'm ready to be forgiven of my sin. We invite you just to come to one of these pastors and say, today I'm trusting in Jesus. If you're here with a friend, say, hey, would you go with me? I'd like to go down professing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. There are others of you here that You watch this young lady follow through in the obedience of baptism. You've never been baptized. The first act of obedience is a follower of Christ. You don't even need to pray. Should I be baptized? That's like praying, should I be disobedient? But instead, today, would you say, you know what? I'm ready to get this right in my life. Oh, I know it doesn't forgive a single sin, but what a powerful testimony it is that I surrender to Jesus. We're going to invite you. Come to one of these pastors as well and say, you know what? I need to be obedient in baptism. Others of you, you know what? I've been looking for a church family and God's led me here to Highland Park. How can I be a part of this church? A member of this church family. And there are many others of you as the Spirit is speaking to your heart. He's placed your workplace on your heart, your school, that class your fellow students, your laborers that you co-labor with, your family. Today, would you commit? I'm going to be a light. 